Ragged Dick, or Street Life in New York with the Bootblacks, by Horatio Alger, Jr. Chapter 1. Ragged Dick is introduced to the reader. "'Wake up there, youngster,' said a rough voice. Ragged Dick opened his eyes slowly, and stared stupidly in the face of the speaker, but did not offer to get up. "'Wake up, you young vagabond!' said the man, a little impatiently. "'I suppose you'd lay there all day if I hadn't called you.' W "'What time is it?' asked Dick. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock? I ought to have been up an hour ago. I know what twas made me so precious sleepy. I went to the old Bowery last night, and didn't turn in till past twelve. You went to the old Bowery? Where'd you get your money? asked the man, who was a porter in the employ of a firm doing business on Spruce Street. Made it by shines, of course. My guardian don't allow me no money for theaters, so I have to earn it. Some boys get it easier than not that, said the boarder significantly. You don't catch me stealin', if that's what you mean, said Dick. Don't you ever steal, then? No, and I wouldn't. Lots of boys does it, but I wouldn't. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that. I believe there's some good in you, Dick, after all. Oh, I'm a rough customer, said Dick, but I wouldn't steal. It's mean. Oh, I'm glad you think so, Dick. And the rough voice sounded gentler than at first. Have you got any money to buy your breakfast? No, but I'll soon get some. While this conversation had been going on, Dick had got up. His bedchamber had been a wooden box, half full of straw on which the young bootblack had reposed his weary limbs, and slept as soundly as if it had been a bed of down. He dumped down into the straw without taking the trouble of undressing. Getting up, too, was an equally short process. He jumped out of the box, shook himself, picked out one or two straws that had found their way into the rents in his clothes, and, drawing a well-worn cap over his uncombed locks, he was all ready for the business of the day. Dick's appearance as he stood beside the box was rather peculiar. His pants were torn in several places, and had apparently belonged in the first instance to a boy two sizes larger than himself. He wore a vest, all the buttons of which were gone except two, out of which peeped a shirt which looked as if it had been worn a month. To complete his costume, he wore a coat too long for him, dating back, if one might judge from its general appearance, to a remote antiquity. Washing the face and hands is usually considered proper in commencing the day, but Dick was above such refinement. He had no particular dislike to dirt, and did not think it necessary to remove several dark streaks on his face and hands. But in spite of his dirt and rags, there was something about Dick that was attractive. It was easy to see that if he had been clean and well-dressed, he would have been decidedly good-looking. Some of his companions were sly, and their faces inspired distrust. But Dick had a frank, straightforward manner that made him a favorite. Dick's business hours had commenced. He had no office to open. His little blacking box was ready for use, and he looked sharply in the faces of all who passed, addressing each with, "'Shine your boots, sir!' "'How much?' asked a gentleman on his way to his office. Ten cents,' said Dick dropping his box, and sinking upon his knees on the sidewalk, flourishing his brush with the air of one skilled in his profession. Ten cents? Isn't that a little steep?' "'Well, you know, taint all clear profit,' said Dick, who had already set to work. "'There's the blacking cost something, and I have to get a new brush pretty often.' "'And you have a large rent, too,' said the gentleman quizzically, with a glance at a large hole in Dick's coat. "'Yes, sir,' said Dick, always ready to joke. "'I have to pay such a big rent for my mansion up on Fifth Avenue "'that I can't afford to take less than ten cents a shine. "'I'll give you a bully shine, sir.' "'Be quick about it, for I am in a hurry. "'So, your house is on Fifth Avenue, is it?' "'It isn't anywhere else,' said Dick, "'and Dick spoke the truth there. "'What tailor do you patronize?' asked the gentleman, "'surveying Dick's attire.' "'Would you like to go to the same one?' asked Dick shrewdly. "'Well, no. 
"'It strikes me that he didn't give you a very good fit.' "'This coat once belonged to General Washington,' said Dick comically. "'He wore it all through the Revolution, and he got torn some, cause he fit so hard. "'When he died, he told his widder to give it to some smart young feller that hadn't got none of his own. "'So she gave it to me. "'But if you'd like it, sir, to remember General Washington by, I'll let you have it reasonable.' "'Thank you, but I wouldn't want to deprive you of it. "'And did your pants come from General Washington, too?' "'No!' They were a gift from Louis Napoleon. Louis had outgrown em and sent em to me. He's bigger than me, and that's why they don't fit. It seems you have distinguished friends. Now, my lad, I suppose you would like your money. I shouldn't have any objection, said Dick. I believe, said the gentleman, examining his pocket-book, I haven't got anything short of twenty-five cents. Have you got any change? Not a cent, said Dick. All my money's invested in the Erie Railroad. That's unfortunate. Shall I get the money changed, sir? I can't wait. I've got to meet an appointment immediately. I'll hand you twenty-five cents, and you can leave the change at my office any time during the day. All right, sir. Where is it? Number 125 Fulton Street. Shall you remember? Yes, sir. What name? Grayson. Office on second floor. "'All right, sir. I'll bring it.' "'I wonder if the little scamp will prove honest,' said Mr. Grayson to himself as he walked away. "'If he does, I'll give him my custom regularly. "'If he don't, as is most likely, I shan't mind the loss of fifteen cents.' Mr. Grayson didn't understand Dick. Our ragged hero wasn't a model boy in all respects. I am afraid he swore sometimes and now and then he played tricks upon unsophisticated boys from the country, or gave a wrong direction to honest old gentlemen unused to the city. A clergyman in search of the Cooper Institute he once directed to the Tombs prison, and following him unobserved was highly delighted when the unsuspicious stranger walked up the front steps of the great stone building on Center Street and tried to obtain admission. "'I guess he wouldn't want to stay long if he did get in,' thought Ragged Dick, hitching up his pants." "'Leastways, I shouldn't. "'They're so precious glad to see you that they won't let you go, "'but board you gratuitous and never send in no bills.' "'Another of Dick's faults was his extravagance. "'Being always wide awake and ready for business, "'he earned enough to have supported him comfortably and respectively. "'There were not a few young clerks who employed Dick from time to time "'in his professional capacity, who scarcely earned as much as he, "'greatly as their style and dress exceeded his.' but Dick was careless of his earnings. Where they went he could hardly have told himself. However much he managed to earn during the day, all was generally spent before morning. He was fond of going to the old Bowery Theatre, and to Tony Pastor's, and if he had any money left afterward, he would invite some of his friends in somewhere to have an oyster stew. So it seldom happened that he commenced the day with a penny. Then I am sorry to add that Dick had formed the habit of smoking. This cost him considerable, for Dick was rather fastidious about his cigars, and wouldn't smoke the cheapest. Besides, having a liberal nature, he was generally ready to treat his companions. But of course the expense was the smallest objection. No boy of fourteen can smoke without being affected injuriously. Men are frequently injured by smoking, and boys always but large numbers of the newsboys and bootblacks form the habit. Exposed to the cold and wet, they find that it warms them up, and the self-indulgence grows upon them. It is not uncommon to see a little boy, too young to be out of his mother's sight, smoking with all the apparent satisfaction of a veteran smoker. There was another way in which Dick sometimes lost money. There was a noted gambling house on Baxter Street, which in the evening was sometimes crowded with these juvenile gamesters, who staked their hard earnings, generally losing, of course, and refreshing themselves from time to time with a vile mixture of liquor at two cents a glass. Sometimes Dick strayed in there, and played with the rest. I have mentioned Dick's faults and defects, because I want it understood, to begin with, that I don't consider him a model boy. But there were some good points about him, nevertheless. He was above doing anything mean or dishonorable. He would not steal, or cheat, or impose upon younger boys, but was frank and straightforward, manly and self-reliant. 
His nature was a noble one, and had saved him from all mean faults. I hope my young readers will like him as I do, without being blind to his faults. Perhaps, although he was only a boot-black, they might find something in him to imitate. And now, having fairly introduced Ragged Dick to my young readers, I must refer them to the next chapter for his further adventures. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 Johnny Nolan After Dick had finished polishing Mr. Grayson's boots, he was fortunate enough to secure three other customers, two of them reporters in the Tribune establishment, which occupies the corner of Spruce Street and Printing House Square. When Dick had got through with his last customer, the City Hall clock indicated eight o'clock. He had been up an hour and hard at work, and naturally began to think of breakfast. He went up to the head of Spruce Street and turned into Nassau. Two blocks further and he reached Ann Street. On this street there was a small, cheap restaurant, where for five cents Dick could get a cup of coffee, and for ten cents more a plate of beefsteak, with a plate of bread thrown in. These Dick ordered and sat down at a table. It was a small apartment with a few plain tables unprovided with cloths, for the class of customers who patronized it were not very particular. Our hero's breakfast was soon before him. Neither the coffee nor the steak were as good as can be bought at Delmonico's, but then it is very doubtful whether, in the present state of his wardrobe, Dick would have been received at that aristocratic restaurant, even if his means had admitted of paying the high prices there charged. Dick had hardly been served when he espied a boy about his own size standing at the door, looking wistfully into the restaurant. This was Johnny Nolan, a boy of fourteen, who was engaged in the same profession as Ragged Dick. His wardrobe was in very much the same condition as Dick's. "'Had your breakfast, Johnny?' inquired Dick, cutting off a piece of steak. "'No.' "'Come in, then. Here's room for you.' "'I ain't got no money,' said Johnny, looking a little enviously at his more fortunate friend. "'Haven't you had any shines?' "'Yes, I had one, but I shan't get any pay till tomorrow. "'Are you hungry? Try me and see. "'Come in. I'll stand the treat this morning.' Johnny Nolan was no wise slow to accept this invitation, and was soon seated beside Dick. "'What'll you have, Johnny?' "'Same as you. Cup of coffee and beefsteak,' ordered Dick. These were promptly brought, and Johnny attacked them vigorously. Now, in the boot-blacking business, as well as in higher avocations, the same rule prevails, that energy and industry are rewarded, and indolence suffers.' Dick was energetic and on the alert for business, but Johnny was the reverse. The consequence was that Dick earned probably three times as much as the other. "'How do you like it?' asked Dick, surveying Johnny's attacks upon the stake with evident complacency. "'It's hunky.' "'I don't believe hunky is to be found in either Webster's or Worcester's big dictionary, but boys will readily understand what it means. "'Do you come here often?' "'asked Johnny. "'Most every day. "'You'd better come, too. "'I can't afford it.' "'Well, you'd ought to, then,' said Dick. "'What did you do, I'd like to know?' "'I don't get near as much as you, Dick.' "'Well, you might if you tried. "'I keep my eyes open. "'That's the way I get jobs. "'You're lazy. "'That's what's the matter.' "'Johnny did not see fit to reply to this charge.' Probably he felt the justice of it, and preferred to proceed with the breakfast, which he enjoyed the more as it cost him nothing. Breakfast over, Dick walked up to the desk and settled the bill. Then, followed by Johnny, he went out into the street. "'Where are you going, Johnny?' "'Up to Mr. Taylor's on Spruce Street, to see if he don't want to shine.' "'Do you work for him regular?' "'Yes. Him and his partner wants a shine most every day. Where are you going?' "'Down front of the Astor House. "'I guess I'll find some customers there.' "'At this moment Johnny started, "'and dodging into an entryway hid behind the door, "'considerably to Dick's surprise. "'What's the matter now?' asked our hero. "'Has he gone?' asked Johnny, his voice betraying anxiety. "'Who gone, I'd like to know. "'That man in the brown coat. "'What of him? "'You ain't scared of him, are you?' "'Yes, he got me a place once.' "'Where?' 
ever so far off. What if he did? I run away. Didn't you like it? No. I had to get up too early. It was on a farm, and I had to get up at five to take care of the cows. I like New York best. Didn't they give you enough to eat? Oh, yes, plenty. And you had a good bed? Yes. Then you'd better have stayed. You don't get either of them here. Where'd you sleep last night? Up an alley in an old wagon. You had a better bed than that in the country, didn't you? Yes, it was soft as, as, as cotton. Johnny had once slept on a bale of cotton, the recollection supplying him with a comparison. Why didn't you stay? I felt lonely, said Johnny. Johnny could not exactly explain his feelings, but it is often the case that the young vagabond of the street, though his food is uncertain, and his bed may be any old wagon or barrel that he is lucky enough to find unoccupied when night sets in, gets so attached to his precarious but independent mode of life that he feels discontented in any other. He is accustomed to the noise and bustle and ever-varied life of the streets, and in the quiet scenes of the country misses the excitement in the midst of which he has always dwelt. Johnny had but one tie to bind him to the city. He had a father living, but he might as well have been without one. Mr. Nolan was a confirmed drunkard, and spent the greater part of his wages for liquor. His potations made him ugly, and inflamed a temper never very sweet, working him up sometimes to such a pitch of rage that Johnny's life was in danger. Some months before he had thrown a flat iron at his son's head, with such terrific force that unless Johnny had dodged he would not have lived long enough to obtain a place in our story. He fled the house, and from that time had not dared to re-enter it. Somebody had given him a brush and a box of blacking, and he had set up in business on his own account. But he had not energy enough to succeed, as has already been stated, and I am afraid the poor boy had met with many hardships, and suffered more than once from cold and hunger. Dick had befriended him more than once, and often given him a breakfast or dinner, as the case might be. "'How'd you get away?' asked Dick, with some curiosity. "'Did you walk?' "'No. I rode on the cars.' "'Where'd you get your money? I hope you didn't steal it.' "'I didn't have none. What did you do, then?' "'I got up about three o'clock and walked to Albany.' "'Where's that?' asked Dick, whose ideas on the subject of geography were rather vague. "'Up the river. How far?' "'About a thousand miles,' said Johnny, whose conceptions of distance were equally vague. "'Go ahead. What did you do then?' "'I hid on top of a freight car and came all the way without their seeing me. "'That man in the broom coat was the man who that got me the place, and I'm afraid he'd want to send me back.' "'Well,' said Dick reflectively, "'I don't know as I'd like to live in the country. "'I couldn't go to Tony Pastor's or the old Bowery. "'There wouldn't be no place to spend my evenings. "'But I say, it's tough in winter, Johnny, "'especially when your overcoat's at the tailor's "'and likely to stay there.' "'That's so, Dick. "'But I must be going, "'or Mr. Taylor will get somebody else to shine his boots.' "'Johnny walked back to Nassau Street "'while Dick kept on his way to Broadway.' "'That boy,' soliloquized Dick, as Johnny took his departure, "'ain't got no ambition. "'I'll bet he won't get five shines to-day. "'I'm glad I ain't like him. "'I couldn't go to the theatre, nor buy no cigars, "'nor get half as much as I wanted to eat. "'Shine your boots, sir?' "'Dick always had an eye to business, "'and this remark was addressed to a young man, "'dressed in a stylish manner who was swinging a jaunty cane.' "'I've had my boots blacked once already this morning, "'but this confounded mud has spoiled the shine. "'I'll make them all right, sir, in a minute. "'Go ahead, then.' "'The boots were soon polished in Dick's best style, "'which proved very satisfactory, "'our hero being a proficient in the art. "'I haven't got any change,' said the young man, "'fumbling in his pocket. "'But here's a bill. "'You may run up somewhere and get changed. "'I'll pay you five cents extra for your trouble.' He handed Dick a two-dollar bill, which our hero took into a store close by. "'Will you please change that, sir?' asked Dick, walking up to the counter. 
The salesman, to whom he proffered it, took the bill, and slightly glancing at it, exclaimed angrily, "'Be off with you, young vagabond, or I'll have you arrested!' "'What's the row?' "'You've offered me a counterfeit bill.' "'I, I didn't know it,' said Dick. "'Don't tell me. Be off, or I'll have you arrested.' End of chapter 2